Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. In this video, we are going to be introducing Unit 2, which is the biological approach. We're going to be going into the biology within psychology. The biological approach looks at behavior as a product of evolution, genetic inheritance, brain structure, or chemical processes in the body. This would all be discussed throughout this unit. So we will be focusing like as the unit suggests, on the biologic, biological influences in behavior, such as brain activity and chemical composition. So hormones, neurotransmitters, and how these affect your behavior. And we would also be looking at some of the evolutionary perspective, as some behaviors can be greatly related to this. So basically, talking about the brain, hormones, genetics. So let's get into the specific topics we're going to be going over in this unit. So we're going to be going over everything about our brain. And we're going to go into specifically localization of function in the brain and different perspectives within that. They're supporting and um, disproving, not disproving, but not supporting evidence. And there's also neuroplasticity, which is the changing of um, functions within the brain as a result of damage or new learning. We're also going to go over neurotransmitters, which um, are the main source of communication in our ne in nervous system and their subsequent effect on behavior. And we're also going to be going over the techniques that we're going to be using to study the brain. And we're also going to be going over hormones and pheromones in behavior, as well as genetics and the role it plays in behavior with um, discussing heritability, and monozygotic, dizygotic twins, twin studies, adoption studies, and more. And lastly, we'll be going over the evolutionary perspective, which will show us um, how certain emotions and tastes are evolutionarily explained, such as disgust, which we'll, we will see in that lesson. Now let's get into lesson one of unit two, localization of brain functions. Localization is basically the notion that every behavior has a specific place in the brain that um, allows the origination of that behavior. So um, this basically says that behavior may be a product of brain structure. So the lo locality of the brain structure will affect the behavior. And there are some studies that do not support this um, notion of localization. And we're gonna look at the different parts of the brain and we're gonna see the different limitations of that. To begin with, we are going to introduce brain structure. So all of these um, subtopics are within the nervous system. So the nervous system is our body's main system of communication, which is a system of neurons, which are nerve cells that interconnect our body. So the nervous system is divided into the CNS, which is a central nervous system, and the PNS, which is a peripheral nervous system. The CNS is like the control center, and it contains the brain and spinal cord. And the PNS is just everything else which um, includes uh, the sensory and motor neurons. And now part of the CNS is the main structure, the brain. So the parts of the brain are the cortex, cere cerebellum, limbic system, and brain, brain stem. We're going to go into specifics with these soon. Okay, so to begin with, the cortex is basically the outer covering of your brain, like that large portion, just all the interconnected fabric of neurons, like the folded surface covering the brain. So this basically controls higher order functions, not just things needed for survival. So these are going to be um, things like abstract thought. And the cortex is the very like topical portion of the brain. So this is considered a newer section of the brain in terms of evolutionary perspective. And this cortex is actually highly folded because as in any other folded structure in biology, like the um, inside the mitochondria and things like that. So the folded surface is basically increasing surface area. So we can have a lot of um, neural impulses going through there so we can maximize the reactions that occur. So the cortex is basically divided into four parts. You may have already heard of this, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. So these are all actually associated with certain functions that um, actually show localization, but they're not actually complete localization because some functions are not restricted to that. And some functions are um, um, very localized, but in different areas of the brain. So this is not 
perfect localization with distinct lines. Moving on, there is actually a divide along the center of the cortex that separates um, the two hemispheres of our brain, the left and right hemisphere. And the structure is called the corpus callosum, which is just an interconnected um, fiber of neurons that's gonna pull the two hemispheres together. And we're gonna look in later slides on studies relating to the corpus callosum um, and seizures. Okay, so moving on, cerebellum. The cerebellum is called the little brain, which actually sits under the cortex, and this is mainly involved in balance and coordination. So now we're into the limbic system. The limbic system is actually in the center middle portion of the brain, and it contains these um, four elements. A good mnemonic to remember this is HATH, hypothalamus, amygdala, thalamus and hippocampus. To begin with, hypothalamus is involved in hunger, emotion, thirst, and sex. H-E-T-S. That's also another mnemonic to help you remember. The thalamus is a sensory router of the brain. This is basically the structure that takes in our sensory information and routes it to the specific areas of the brain that will go on to process it. And we also have the amygdala, which is involved in emotions, basically. Um, memory, emotion, and fear. And a really good um, mnemonic for this is to remember Amy Gadala. She is a very emotionally unstable person. And we can remember the function of amygdala by remembering Amy Gadala, emotion. And we also have another mnemonic for hippocampus, which is involved in learning, spatial orientation, and long-term memory. The major function of this is memory. So we can think of if we saw a hippo on our high school campus, we would definitely remember that. So hippocampus, good for memory. And these, um, all of these mnemonics on this slide were provided to us by our dear teacher, Mr. Dunlop. Thank you. Um, moving on, the brainstem is actually underneath the limbic system, and this is all about survival. Um, we have parts of the brainstem that are responsible for breathing and heartbeat, like the um, medulla and this like system is very old in terms of evolutionary processes because one of the basic necessities of an organism is to survive so this would have evolved first okay so this uh, these are some images for you to um, locate each part of the brain and just um, holistically view the information that was just discussed and this image was actually straight from your textbook so go check that out Okay, let's get on to some research that um, will go on to support localization. So Paul Broca in 1861 studied a man named Tan. He actually experienced Broca's aphasia, which is the, um, which is the effect of the removal of the Broca's area. And this was actually as a result of gangrene, which is like rotting flesh as a result of um, some bacterial infection. You can research more into that. But what actually happened to Tan was that he, um, his Broca's area, which is responsible for speech production, actually rotted away as a result of gangrene. And um, as a result of that, he could not speak properly. He could not produce speech. All he could say was um, the phrase Tan. All, he, all that he spoke was just Tan, Tan, Tan. So um, as a result of this, Paul Broca did further research and he, um, used a large base of data to determine the Broca's area, which he said was the localization of speech production. So as a result of the absence of the Broca's area, he determined that you need the Broca's area to produce logical speech. And moreover, we also have the Wernicke's area, which was discovered by Carl Wernicke, I hope I'm saying that right, in 1874. This is the comprehension of written and spoken language. So basically, these um, psychologists were able to find localizations of function by um, investigating people who didn't have those areas and seeing the effects. So if someone didn't have the Broca's area and they couldn't speak, we could um, most likely attribute that to the Broca's area being responsible for speech because the absence of that does not allow us to have speech. So both of these studies used a research methodology, case study, which we learned in unit one, to learn about the brain. 
So they basically used naturally occurring brain lesions, for example, from the gangrene, and then they just conducted autopsies on these patients after their death. Um, however, there are some limitations to this because natural lesions are not clean cut. Clean as in perfectly like in a straight line across this cortex. They're just very arbitrary and randomly set. And also in this type of case study, you're going to have to wait until the patient dies, sadly, in order to actually investigate them. So there is very large time constraint on this. So we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at these studies. More um, research supporting localization. Um, one of these was done by Wilder Penfield using the method of neural stimulation, which is just stimulating different parts of the brain. And we're going to see the effects on the body because, um, you know, biology elicits some uh, behavior. So they, he basically mapped all these brain functions as a result of using this um, neural stimulation technique. And he made a map, which is called the cortical homunculus, and this was basically just a map of the sensory and motor cortex. And he found that areas such as the hands, the tongue, and the, that's actually supposed to say lips, are highly sensitive and have large brain areas dedicated to them. And areas like the back and chest are actually not largely expressed because um, they're more insensitive. And this makes sense as we actually use our hands a lot and we need to be able to have a high sensitivity there so we can feel um, and you know navigate our world properly and um, areas like the back and chest where we're not actually needing to be really sensitive there because um, we actually navigate our world more through our senses and through our hands through touch so that's um, supporting localization as a sensory motor cortex is localized for functions such as these now let's get on to some research opposing the idea of strict localization. So here we have Carl Lashley, who was a psychologist who used rats and carefully induced brain damage um, onto them just randomly in terms of brain mass rather than specific localization. So he used rats and he removed varying amounts of brain um, mass from the rats and found the differences in the effectivity, effectiveness of their learning. And he determined that the less brain mass there was, the less efficient learning became. So this basically is considered the principle of mass action, showing that like the more brain there is, the more effective learning would be. So rats that had more brain mass would like learn more effective, while rats that had less brain mass would learn not as effective. So he just determined that the ability to learn the maze and remember the areas that the rat has to go in order to complete the maze, he just concluded that this process was widely distributed rather than localized. So he just said that um, any amount of brain would be responsible for this rather than just a specific locality. And lastly, equipotentiality is the ability of one brain part to cover another's functions through um, neuroplasticity. So we saw research supporting localization and we also saw research not supporting localization so where are we now um so currently neuroscientists actually support something called relative localization this just is a middle ground where localization is there for some functions under some conditions but we are also going to acknowledge, acknowledge the limitations of localization because um higher order functions like memory and um just thought in general is very higher order and can't really be localized to certain areas. But then as we saw in Broca's study, speech production is localized in the Broca's area. So we're just gonna say some functions are localized while others are not as localized. Moving on, we have split brain research. Like I said, from the corpus callosum discussion before, this is where we're at. So lateralization is basically the division of functions between the right and left hemisphere which is a really special case of localization as the corpus callosum. It's connecting the two um, hemispheres and each hemisphere has a different overall function. And um, these studies were conducted by Sperry and Gazaniga. So um, Sperry was actually the pioneer of this area and later he collaborated with Michael Gazaniga to conduct some split brain research. Um, so 
in patients with seizures, um, the corpus callosum is actually severed in order to reduce the severe effects of these seizures. So um, in these split brain researches, Sperry and Gazaniga investigated the effects of a separate lateralization, not even connected. So the corpus callosum was severed, so the left and right hemisphere could not even communicate. So one of these studies involved the flashing of the word heart, H-E-A-R-T, in a way that H-E was displayed on the left and A-R-T was displayed to the right of the visual field. Now, if we know that the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the Broca's area responsible for speech production is in our left frontal lobe, which controls our right side of our body, the right eye saw the word art, which was on the right side of the visual field. So that means the split brain patient was able to process the speech of that and they were able to say that they saw art. However, we don't have a speech production localization in our right side of our brain. So they only pointed to he, which controlled the left side of the body, which contained the left eye, which saw he. So in this case, we can see the localization of the two hemispheres through lateralization. As a result of the two hemispheres not being able to communicate, um, the patients were only able to say that they saw art, but or able to point to he. So now that we've seen both sides of the argument, we can conclude that some functions are localized weakly, such as language, because we saw that from split brain studies. And we can also say that some functions are widely distributed, such as memory from the major running experiment on rats from Lashley's study, because less brain mass equaled less memory. But it wasn't actually localized anywhere. And we can also say that components of a function may be localized while others are not, while others are distributed. Language as a whole is holistic and can encompass different localities of the brain, but it can also be localized, such as speech production from the Broca's area. So final thing, localization is not static. We can go through something called re-specialization to reconstruct the functions and locations of the brain, which is equivalent to neuroplasticity. So if we get our brain area somewhere damaged, our other brain um, parts can actually obtain that function through neuroplasticity, the changing of neurons. And we're actually going to go into more depth into neuroplasticity in the next lesson. We're going to learn about cortical remapping and synaptic changes. Thank <laughs> you.